Yeah, so we're in, we're in Genesis chapter 11. And within the grand narrative of Genesis, the flood is now over. The Lord has again commanded man to be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, make the earth teem with people. The earth is to be teeming with people. Um, And yet we're not quite to Abram yet. We're in that kind of middle stage between the generations just after the flood and Abram. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we rejoice at the opportunity to study your word. We thank you that you have sent forth your spirit to cause the Bible to be written and that you have sent him into our hearts by that same word that we may come to know and apprehend and believe the scriptures. Send forth that spirit again to us now as we study your word and we learn of your will, enable us by that spirit through that word to do your will. In the name of Jesus, your son, our savior. Amen. Okay. Genesis 11. The state of mankind is more familiar to us at this point than it is prior to the flood. But it's still unfamiliar to us in a couple of ways. Now, as we read through this, remember the Lord's command. Be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. That's going to be important. So beginning with Genesis 11. Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. And let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. Okay, so we just finished off with what we call the Table of Nations, Genesis chapter 10, where Moses recounts to us the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, Ham, and Japheth, and their descendants. Now, of course, of those three sons, the most important to us is going to be Shem, because this is the line that's going to be traced from Genesis 3 all the way to Matthew chapter 1. And it is going to be these people who are the focus of the story, basically, of the rest of the Old Testament. In particular, the descendants of one certain Semite by the name of Abraham. We're not quite there yet. At this point, the Lord's intent is that man scatter, go their ways, We looked at the map last week and we saw that Shem, Ham, and Japheth all went kind of different directions. But we noted a couple of times that much of the scattering happens actually after the events of uh, Genesis 10. It's actually going to happen after the Tower of Babel. Right? Um, The Lord's command was that they go. There's There's a whole earth to populate. And what, what do they do? Yeah, let's, let's stay here, pool our resources, right? Here's the thing. To our 21st century ears, this doesn't sound like sin. Oh, all the peoples of the world, like dwelling in peace and harmony and all speaking the same language and working together on a project, right? Isn't Davos going on this week? So, um, they're, what are they doing? All of this is in disobedience to God's command. He said, go, spread out, populate the earth. And they're gathering in one spot on the plain of Shinar, 
Where's the plane of Shinar? It's in Mesopotamia. Where is Mesopotamia? Yeah, this is going to be right around where Babylon will be. Where Uruk will be. Where Akkad will be. Now, whether those are three different cities or three districts of the same city, you get the point. Mesopotamia is just Greek for in the middle of the rivers. This is between the Tigris and Euphrates. This is like modern-day Iraq. And unlike so much of the Arabian Peninsula, this land is comparatively easy to traverse. Comparatively. You know, you head north, you get into what's now Iran, you get these just horrendous mountains that form a giant wall. Uh, but here it's a plain. It's not mountainous. And it's comparatively, again, if you've ever li lived in Iowa, comparatively fertile. <laughs> Especially when compared to the rest of the Arabian Peninsula. So, we got water. We've got arable land. It's easy to traverse. It's spread out so you can, you can make a big city for yourself. And so they reckon that's where they're going to stay. In disobedience to God's word which was, go, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. And we're also told there was another angle to their disobedience. Pride. Let us make a name for ourselves. Right? In other words, this wasn't like, let's, let's build a great monument to God's greatness and mercy in showing our forefather Noah and his sons through the flood. This is all about them. And if you notice, once again, if, if you come at history with the idea that ancient peoples were dumb, you're going to come across a lot of things that will not make sense to you until you let that go. They're building, they're building bricks because stones there are, are rare. But they're, they're heating the bricks so hot that they are to them almost like stones. right? That's what that whole, let us make brick for stone. Not only are they baking the bricks, they're not fragile, crumbly bricks, uh, but, but these are very, very strong. And then they're mortared together with what? Yeah, bitumen, right? It's like a tar, which has a very uh, long-lasting, sticky sort of property to it. And... How, how high are they going to make this thing? Yeah, we're going to make it as high as heaven, right? In other words, we're going to make ourselves equal to God. We're going to build a tower up to the heavens, right? There's a lot of hubris involved. And what are they trying to avoid? Being dispersed over the face of the earth. That's what we don't want. We don't want to be dispersed over the face of the earth. In other words, we don't want to be separated out into multiple nations. We want to be all together one nation. Now look at verse 6. Verse 6 runs contrary to everything John Lennon ever taught me. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they have all one language, and this is only the beginning of what they will do and nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. I don't know that that's literally true. Um, because obviously as God, he knows, he knows the limitations because he built them into their, into their nature. But certainly all kinds of things will not be impossible for them because you have very intelligent, capable people gathering, united around this one very wicked project. Right, And the intent of the Lord, as we learned in the last chapter, was that they not be one people. The intent was that they be multiple peoples, right? And they decided to disobey that to make themselves into one people. And notice not only are they one people, but they also have one language, right? This... This is the, the, the chapter that comes to mind every time we, we suffer through learning another foreign language. 
man, if not for the Tower of Babel, I wouldn't have had to learn this stuff. These declensions are killing me. Thanks a lot, Nimrod. But they all have one language. What language was it? No idea. Um, linguists will try to... to, to I mean, I, I'm kind of partial just to the Proto-Indo-European thing because it, it does seem to make sense in that there are languages that to us don't seem to be related that nonetheless have things together, have things in common. Was it Latin? I, I like that one just because. I have, no, I have no actual reason to believe it. I just like the thought. Many people in the 16th century assumed it was Hebrew. Not sure that's true. But it is true that Many languages, you, you look through the roots and you realize there are some similarities even between languages. Because, you know, for example, if, if you know Spanish and you try to read Italian, you can actually kind of hack it a little bit. You know, what, this, this word or that word might throw you, but if you're not too careful about translating tenses and stuff, you can kind of hack your way through it. And, and, and maybe if you encountered Portuguese, it's a little weirder, but even then you'll see some things like, okay... There's a little squiggle over that letter. I don't recognize that, but whatever. I'll just keep muddling through. Um, but even languages that seem like they're not related, like Spanish and Russian. In Spanish and Russian, um, Spanish, te, and Russian, t, both mean you, singular, second person. And you'll see little things like this where, where certain roots will make their way around and... Um, and, and they'll find their way even into languages like Japanese and Hindi that aren't really related, but there does seem to be a common root to the languages. But whatever that, that language was, they're not speaking it after Babel. The Lord confuses them all. How many do I know? One really well, and that's English. The, the rest at various levels. I know Spanish and German okay-ish. I know like just enough to be dangerous of like German or, or of, of Russian and um, Latin. It's different. Your mouth has to like twist. It's weird. Your tongue has to be like just a, a micron behind your teeth. I think it's because it's cold. Um, <laughs> sure. Yeah. Greek, Greek and Hebrew, right? He, Hebrew is a very different language and it's, it's not just the letters. Greek is a very Western language. Greek has like a thousand rules and like three exceptions. It's very Western. Point A, point B. It's lovely. Hebrew has like three rules and a thousand exceptions. It's like ev everything is like this except for this whole list over here that isn't. It's, and, and there were some guys in seminary that got to Hebrew and they just, they were like fish to water. That was not me. I might have said something like if I had to speak this in the wilderness, I would have complained too. I might have said that. <laughs> Now look at, verse, uh, look at verse 7. The Lord continues, he says, Come, let us go down and there confuse their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. Now first of all, why, why again is the Lord saying, let us? This is the Trinity, right? Now why in the Lutheran Study Bible didn't they capitalize the U? Whatever. Um, let us go down and there confuse their language. And to confuse means what? Yeah. Make it to where they can't really work together and communicate. Verse 8. So the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of all the earth, and they left off building the city. Therefore its name was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord dispersed them over the face of all the earth. So they weren't dispersing themselves, so the Lord does it for them. He disperses them, right? You all wanted to gather together in one place, so the Lord will spread you out from there. There is a, there's a similarity. It's not a perfect one-to-one -one parody, but there's a similarity between the events of the Tower of Babel and Pentecost. At Pentecost, Jesus commanded the disciples to stay in Jerusalem until you receive the Holy Spirit. So there they were all gathered in one place. The goal is, once you receive the Holy Spirit, what? 
you will be my witnesses in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. However, the record shows that they kind of stuck close to Jerusalem until persecution came, in which case they were pretty glad to leave Jerusalem. In other words, the Lord had to kind of get, get out. The whole point of Pentecost was the Lord sends his spirit so that his apostles will go spread the gospel to the lands that didn't have it. And they were, as a matter of fact, if you read, if you read the book of Acts and, and other narratives in the New Testament after the Gospels, the church in Jerusalem was kind of prone to just hang out there and not, not be terribly active, right? Especially when you compare it with, with Paul. Paul is going to be almost inhumanly active. He doesn't rest. Whereas Jerusalem is, they're pretty static. Uh, but now, very often preachers will take Pentecost and use that as an opportunity to say that the curse of Babel is reversed, except it is not. And I'll prove it. You didn't have to learn a new language when you became a Christian. Right? For example, if you go buy a Quran at Barnes & Noble, don't. But if you do, and it's in English, it's not going to say the Quran. It's going to say an interpretation of the Holy Quran. Why? It's only the Quran if it's in Arabic. If you want to be a practicing Muslim, you've got to know Arabic. Now, as it happens, that's not that difficult because most Muslims speak it anyway. But, Chris... Right, yeah, Indonesia, Iran, maybe not so much. Um, Christianity does not have one language that you must know that is our official language of our religion. The Bible can be relayed in most languages. There are some languages that are so limited you basically have to invent the other half of the language for the Bible to work. Um, that's actually what missionaries do a lot. Uh, for example, Cyril and Methodius. When they want to be missionaries to the Slavs, the Slavs will never written language. So they build the Cyrillic alphabet, which if you ever look really close at the Cyrillic alphabet, you'll realize they totally ripped off from the Greek alphabet, which is cool because it makes it easier to learn because there's Russian's hard enough. Um, but a, a well-developed language with a, with a good, um, with a good dictionary, a, a good number of, of words in it is going to be very capable of carrying the gospel, right? Because if you notice, at Pentecost, what languages are being, are being spoken? It's actually not Greek and Latin. These are little regional dialects. These are tribal dialects of smaller peoples in smaller places, right? These are what are called mother tongues. In other words, they're not the language of like international business. They're the language your mom speaks at home. And so our services here at Christ Lutheran Church are in English. Why? Because that's what we know. If we were a bunch of like fresh off the boat German immigrants, our service would be in German. And basically they were almost entirely across the LCMS until 1917. Um, missions to Spanish speaking people are in Spanish, which is the official language of the Christian religion. There isn't one. So the, the, the curse isn't exactly reversed. Instead of having everyone speaking the same language again, much as I would love it, because it would probably be Latin, which I love. But rather than doing that, instead, you have the gospel going forth in people's own languages. Why? Because the Spirit is powerful. He's God. He's omnipotent. He can carry the gospel in English, Spanish, French, whatever. Um, the name Babel, and if you say Babel, that's fine. Um, there's, there's always that... When you take a word from one language and put it in another, you know, some people say amen, some people say amen. No, there's, there's not like a requirement to say it one way or the other. But um, it, that, that Hebrew root there, it sounds like the word confused, right? They called it confused because that's where the, so the, the tower gets half built. They, le they leave off building it. The Lord scatters them. Okay. If someone is speaking in a foreign language in your presence, they're almost certainly talking about you whether or not they actually are, <laughs> right? What are they saying about me? Now, 
don't get me wrong, it's really cool to do the whole trick of they don't know that I speak the language that they're speaking, but I do, and then I respond to them and they go, Arr! you know, even if what they were saying was completely innocent. You know, that's that's always that's always a favorite. But you you immediately lose trust in a society when everyone doesn't speak the same language. You go instantly from being a high trust society to a low trust society when everyone is not united around a common tongue. Because I don't know what they're plotting against me. But I know they are. That's absolutely yeah, that's that's human nature, and that's that's not unique to one one group of people or another. You lose trust when you don't speak the same language together. Oh, of course, yeah, yeah. All, all the more if they're whispering or they're covering their mouth. Yeah, very suspicious. So, so now they're, they're forced to live among groups that speak the same language. Now we're going to focus in on one of the sons of Noah, namely Shem. Japheth is not going to show up much at all until really the Gospels. I mean, we mentioned that Jeremiah makes, makes reference to a, a couple of the descendants of, of Japheth. But Japheth has north. He's north. You know, he's the older son that goes to college, and then you don't really see much of him anymore. Um, the rest of the story of the Old Testament is going to focus on the descendants of Shem, and not all the descendants of Shem, but really focusing on, on one man, Abraham, and his descendants, particularly through... Jacob, right? And in addition to that, the nation that comes forth from Jacob, or Israel, we also have the, the specific line, the patrilineal succession, from Adam through David to Jesus, right? That line is going to be preserved. So now we're just going to focus in on Shem. These are the generations of Shem. When Shem was a hundred years old, he fathered Arpachsad two years after the flood. And Shem lived after he fathered Arpachsad five hundred years and had other sons and daughters. When Arpachsad had lived thirty-five years, he fathered Shelah. And Arpachsad lived after he fathered Shelah four hundred three years and had other sons and daughters. When Shelah had lived thirty years, he fathered Eber. And Shelah lived after he fathered Eber four hundred three years and had other sons and daughters. When Eber had lived 34 years, he fathered Peleg. And Eber lived after he fathered Peleg 430 years and had other sons and daughters. Just pausing here for a second, what was noteworthy about Eber? Yeah, his, his name, his name, yeah, his, his name is the root of the word Hebrew, right? So that, like we mentioned, the nation that's going to come forward, we're going to call them the Israelites, because they come forth from Jacob or Israel, they're also sometimes called the Hebrews, because these are the descendants of Eber, right? We don't really call them Jews yet. Um, the Bible doesn't even use that term until the time of the Second Temple in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah, right? Um, plus, that only refers to one tribe. The name itself refers to Judah. Um, the Israelites are a little bit more encompassing. And... Um, as, as long as the northern kingdom hasn't been destroyed yet, we're going to typically go with Israel, the, the Hebrews, or the Israelites. Yes, Israelites and Hebrews were basically going to be interchangeable. What was noteworthy about Peleg, remember his name means divided. And so the, the theory is that Peleg is alive during the Tower of Babel, when the earth gets divided up and, and the people are flung to the, to the corners of the earth. Notice, by the way, the age at which they're fathering children is, right, it's, it's starting to look a little bit more like the world that we know, where you're not having 100-year-old men give birth. Now they're in their 30s, right? Their lifespans, are their lifespans are also coming down to more like what we're used to. Um, by the way, if you have a, a, a Greek Bible in front of you, you'll notice that it reads a little bit differently in that this is going to read a little bit more like earlier genealogies where each one is going to end with, and he died. Right? The, the, the Masoretic text doesn't have, and he died. Presumably because, literally speaking, a lot of the point of, and he died, in the earlier genealogy was to highlight the fact that one of them didn't. Verse 20. 
When Roy had lived 32 years, he fathered Sarug, and Roy lived after he fathered Sarug 207 years and had other sons and daughters. When Sarug had lived 30 years, he fathered Nahor, and Sarug lived after he fathered Nahor 200 years and had other sons and daughters. When Nahor had lived 29 years, he fathered Terah, and Nahor lived after he fathered Terah 119 years and had other sons and daughters. When Terah had lived 70 years, he fathered Abram, Nahor, and Haran. What did we say last week about Terah? He's the father of Abraham. He's an idolater. Well, for one thing, the old order is over. The, the, the pre-flood order is over in many ways. Um, there's probably some grace to it and that they're not living through a life of sin as long. That's the other thing, too, is that you, you do have, when the Lord speaks, he says, you know, man shall live 120 years. Now, granted, that's 120 years before the flood, so it was kind of a countdown clock, but the lifespan does seem to be pretty well capped around there. I mean, if, if nothing else, you can see the world over the successive generations looking more and more like the world that we inhabit. Verse 27. Now these are the generations of Terah. Terah fathered Abram, Nahor, and Haran, and Haran fathered Lot. Haran died in the presence of his father Terah in the land of his kindred, in Ur of the Chaldeans. And Abram and Nahor took wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife Milcah, the daughter of Har- so, and the name of Nahor's wife Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah and Iscah. Now Sarai was barren; she had no child. So now we see Terah has three sons, right? Um, Haran is important because he's the father of Lot, and Lot's going to be important later. Haran dies in the presence of his father Terah. And notice the the land in which this happens. Where is it? In Ur. Where's Ur? Yeah, it's 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 yeah, it's it's east over toward where like the plain of Shinar would be in that region of the world. So it's 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 a little bit further east and south of there. It's a good deal away from the land that the Lord is going to be promising Abram. I mean, spoilers, but you knew that. There were, some of, some of the Semitic peoples did live that far out east. So Abram and Nahor take wives. Abram's wife is called Sarai. Now what do we know about Sarai? She's barren, and she was beautiful. Right, yeah, we also learn that later. We, we learn other things about Sarai too later. She's, she's Abram's half-sister. So when, when, when Abram says he's her, or she's his sister, he's kind of not entirely wrong. It was a lie, but it was also kind of not entirely false. So they go forth together from Ur of the Chaldeans to go into the land of Canaan, right? Where's the land of Canaan? The land of Canaan is the location of most of the narrative of the rest of the Old Testament, right? This is where the descendants of Canaan inhabit. The Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, right? The same lands that are going to be given in the book of Joshua to the tribes of Israel. Right? So Canaan, the promised land, these two are, are going to be the same thing. You know, ex- yeah, for, especially for Texans, this is not a large chunk of land. Yeah, like our, our circuit in Wyoming was, was about the same land mass as the state of Maryland. I mean, we, we'd have circuit winkles, and some people were driving over three hours to get there. But here you have a relatively smaller, by our standards, piece of land inhabited by very different sorts of people, living close together, often in conflict. And that's that's the land of Canaan, right? Because the Canaanites, they're going to hate the Israelites, but they don't always like each other. They're violent people. They're warlike people. 
So Abram and Sarai, they venture off toward, um, toward Canaan. Chapter 12. Who made the Tower of Babel? He was waiting for me. Um, historically, this is going to be Nimrod, right? Remember we learned that Nimrod was a mighty hunter with the implication that not only did he hunt animals, he was also kind of, hunt, kind of a hunter of people, like an early emperor sort. Um, he, he's described as being exceedingly wicked. Um, so yeah, his, historically, the Tower of Babel is built by Nimrod. Chapter 12. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred, and show your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and in him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So, there's this little, little family, Abram and Sarai, from, from this family, the Lord is going to bless all the nations of the earth. What's the fulfillment of this prop, prophecy? Jesus. Jesus is the fulfillment of this prophecy. In what way is Jesus a descendant of Abraham? In both senses, right? Jesus is a descendant of Abraham in both senses. His bloodline runs through the man Abram, Abraham. And in addition, he also possesses the faith of Abraham, that which made Abram or Abraham righteous in the sight of the Lord. Why do I bring this up? Because many understand the fulfillment of this prophecy to be either Israel as a nation in the Old Testament or the nation state of Israel founded in 1948 as a fulfillment of this. The fulfillment of this is in Jesus, right? For one thing, Sarai is barren. How is a barren woman going to be giving birth to a great nation? Right, right. The Lord is going to demonstrate His power and His mercy multiple times throughout this bloodline, Sarai being but one example, right? Mary's another. Mary's not barren necessarily, uh, but, but the manner in which she conceives is perhaps even more miraculous still, that she never knew a man, and yet here she's, she's pregnant, right? Many miracles are attended throughout this line. And many times the line is very nearly cut off. That's going to happen a lot in Genesis. Verse 4. So Abram went, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Now why is Lot with Abram? His, yeah, his father died, right? His father died on the side of uh, Terah, Lot's grandfather. And so now Lot, instead of being with his dad, is going to be with Abram. And also, Sarai's barren. So, it makes perfect sense for Abram and Sarai to take, take Lot kind of into their family and provide for him. And so Lot goes with Abram. Besides, I mean... Father Abraham is 75 years old. Now, granted, in these days, they're still living a little longer than we are now, but they're not, they're not doing the whole, like, Noah giving birth at hundreds and hundreds of years old, right? Verse 5. And Abram took Sarai his wife, and Lot his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people that they had acquired in Haran, and they set out to go to the land of Canaan. When they came to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land at, to the place at Shechem, to the oak of Morah. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. Okay, so they sojourn into Canaan. 
not a short trip by any stretch. They get there, and there are, there are people living there, namely the, the Canaanites. Now, why does it say, at that time, the Canaanites were living in the land? Because, yeah, because when this is written, they're about to not live there. So Moses thinks. Moses doesn't live to see the events of the book of Joshua, uh, where they don't fully displace or destroy the Canaanites. But Israel does displace and destroy much of the Canaanites, and they do inhabit most of the land of Canaan. But again, remember, Moses is writing this many, many, many years in the future from when this is happening. So at that time, the Canaanites were in the land. Now, here in verse 12, the Lord gives Abram a promise, which is what? Give whom that land? To your offspring. There's an ambiguity in the way that modern English works in that some words are pluralized by keeping them the same, like moose. I saw one moose, I saw three moose, right? That ship has one cannon, that ship has, well, I don't maybe not with a military, maybe not with a naval vessel, but like with artillery, right? Cannon is plural, cannon is singular, Um, trout, offspring, sometimes colloquially can be used this way. Is offspring singular or plural? No, there's a definite answer. Yes. Turn to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians 3.16, commit this to memory. St. Paul is, is putting on a little Bible study. But it, it is good for, for, for this to be legitimized. Paul does this in a number of places where he will look at the grammar of a text and explain how that's important to us. That's always good to remember because sometimes people are prone to think, well, why, does, why could the grammar matter that much? I don't, I don't think it's that important. But if you look, Paul's doing it in the Bible. Paul's taking the grammar of, of the books of Moses and explaining its importance within the Scriptures, which is to say, within the inspired Scriptures. So look at Galatians 3.16. Now the promises were made to Abraham and his offspring. It does not say, and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one and to your offspring who is Christ. This, this could also be translated seed. Yeah, offspring or seed. And seed, kind of the same way, right? Um, you know, a, a, a fellow who sells seed, he's not selling one. He's selling, you know, truckloads, to your offspring, singular, and, and we know that this is Christ. Yeah, and, and this is the thing. Scripture interprets Scripture, right? So don't, don't read the Old Testament pretending like you don't know the New Testament, like you're trying to discover these things for yourself. Bring with you everything you know of the fulfillment of these prophecies to the prophecies, and you'll, you'll see how they work out in, in history. I mean, that's, that's why they're written, right? so that you can see. So you learn, for example, from the Gospels what sort of man Jesus is. Then on Good Friday, when we read from from, uh, Isaiah 52 and 53 about the man acquainted with sorrows, he had no form that we should look at him. All, you know, all we like sheep have gone astray and the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. You know, we considered him stricken, um, smitten by God and afflicted. Um, Like a sheep led to its shearers, he opened not his mouth. You, you see that happening in the Passion accounts in the Gospels. Bring all of that with you when you encounter that prophecy. And now you see, I mean, Isaiah, 800 years previous or 700 years previous, he's got it exactly. I mean, he's describing Jesus in, in very specific sorts of terms, right? So yeah, exactly. Make use of your New Testament knowledge. Bring it with you into the Old Testament. And you'll find out that, one, they're not as conflicting as many people think they are. There's, there's a, a wonderful harmony there. Um, and also things that, if you didn't know the New Testament, might be somewhat difficult to understand, are often made clear in the New Testament. That's kind of the other thing they're doing. So back to Genesis 12, back to what's 
sometimes called the call of Abram, where the Lord calls to him. Verse 8, from there he moved to the hill country on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent, and with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. Remember we, when we read, read through uh, the book of Joshua? Remember when we come to the battle of Ai? That's the next major battle after Jericho, and there have to be two because the first time they try, they don't, they don't do so the Lord's way. They, they take pride in themselves and they're, dis, they're defeated. They have to go at it again, remember? Um, and then, then the Lord gives them the victory. Well, that's, that's AI that you know, Abraham was, or Abram was there, right? And there he built an altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed on, still going toward the Negev. So, while we know that Abram's father, Terah, was an idolater, Abram himself believes. And how do we know that? He, yeah, one, the scripture says it. Two, he builds an altar and calls on the name of the Lord. What is, what's that describing, calling on the name of the Lord? Yeah, prayer, worship, right? Prayer is, after all, an act of worship, right? It's probably the most fundamental and common form of worship. So this is, he's, he's a believer, right? And notice that by believer, we don't just mean he harbors the right opinions about God in his own mind. His, right, his faith leads him to do the works that he does, like building the altar, calling on the name of the Lord, and doing the Lord's will. Do what? Leaving his family. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Leaving Ur, leaving his family behind, going to sojourn in Canaan, where all the people are wicked and they're, they're going to hate him. Um, that's an act of faith. Okay, we're going to leave there. We're going to pick up with, the, with them getting to Egypt. Any other questions on the bits that we read today from 11 and 12? All right, then let's close with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. All right, thank you.